Hello, I'm John Rickert, pastor of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Newark, Delaware. The message you are about to listen to was de delivered on March 11, 2020, which was Wednesday in the week of Lent 2. It is the third in our series on our custom stations of the cross and covers stations 6 through 8. Images of the stations will appear during the video. The text for the message was Isaiah 53, 8. May God bless you through the hearing of his word. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for tonight is taken from our reading out of Isaiah. I read again chapter 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Hearing the reading of our text, may God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. In contemporary action movies, how many people like action movies even? Okay. In contemporary action movies, there really are only a couple of plot lines. Have you ever noticed that? A very common one goes something like this. A person is somehow abused, maybe murdered. Unfortunately for that criminal, this person has a friend or family member who will stop at nothing to save or avenge the abused person. After overcoming numerous challenges, the hero seems to be out of options and failure seems to loom before him. There is but one chance left, a chance in a million to succeed. The hero must risk all, which he does. Surprise, surprise, the impossibly risky move works and the bad guy is either caught or killed. While the hero in such movies does many things that we would consider questionable at best and maybe just downright wrong, wrong you see them running through murdering countless people, the redeeming feature in their character is that they are sacrificing all for someone else. Often they have more than one chance to quit, leaving the victim at the mercy of the bad guy. But the plight of the victim compels the hero to go forward and to put it all on the line. And in spite of bullet wounds and cuts and broken bones and whatever else, the hero perseveres. Today, as we continue with our Lord on his way of sorrows, we see him abused. But like the hero in those action movies, he does not undergo the suffering for himself, but for others whom he holds dear and they are in dire circumstances. Who are there dear, those dear ones that are in deadly peril? All humanity. So he was oppressed for all. He was stricken for all. He was abused for all. In Station 6, and again, if you just look in your bulletin, you can see we have all three stations we're considering tonight pictured there. In Station 6, we see our Lord being flogged by a Roman soldier. He is wearing a crown of thorns. A bystander watches. This bystander is no hero, for he is not interested in stopping the injustice he sees. As Isaiah wrote, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom hide, men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Faithfulness to his call for our Lord meant suffering abuse for his dear ones, for us, to rescue us from our deadly peril. In the lower left-hand corner is depicted a rather small incident in the Old Testament. So if you don't know it, I would not be surprised. Jeremiah had told the people that Babylon was coming because of their sins. There was no stopping Babylon because the people would not repent of their idolatry. It wasn't that they didn't recognize the true God as a God. It was that they considered him as only one God among many gods. 
how terribly contemporary all paths lead to heaven, right? They were very inclusive, very 21st century. Pasher was a priest, a chief officer in the temple, and a false prophet. Having heard Jeremiah, Pasher had him beat and then put into the stocks. So Jeremiah, like our Lord, was abused for being faithful to his call. In the lower right-hand corner is another rather small incident from the Old Testament, although better known. This comes from the stories about Elijah and happened shortly after Elijah had been taken up to heaven. Elijah was traveling to Mount Carmel and was passing by Bethel, which means house of God. Beth, house, El, God. And it's the generic name for God, so it's not the God. It's, you know, any old God you happen to think of, Bethel. Might be the real God. In this case, it wasn't. Because in the days of Elijah, uh, there was a major shrine to the idol Baal at Bethel. A mob of the boys who served as acolytes at the shrine came out and began to ridicule the prophet of God. Most of these boys would have been teenagers or in their early 20s, about the same age that David was when he took out Goliath. So if you think David was 5 or 10, you're wrong. He was between 15 and, and 29. You know, and these boys would have been in that same age slot. The story is best known from what happened to the acolytes of Baal. Two bears came out of the wilderness and killed 42 of them. So when I say it was a mob, there was a real mob. The point of the comparison in the, in the station, though, has nothing to do with the bears. What we see is that Elijah was abused and ridiculed for being faithful to his calling, just as Jesus was abused and ridiculed for being faithful to his calling. In such cases, like Jeremiah and Elijah, and so many others, the abuse and ridicule received by those who are faithful to their calling foreshadows the abuse that our Lord received during his final hours. The abuse our Lord received, though, had a far better, uh, greater benefit, a benefit that reaches forward to this day and beyond, all the way to the second coming. Elijah was ridiculed by faithless people for being faithful, as was Jesus. However, Jesus suffered the ridicule by faithful, faithless people for the benefit of those very faithless people. He was faithful to compensate for their faithlessness. Jeremiah suffered because he warned the people as did Jesus, who preached that people should repent and believe the gospel. The gospel Jesus preached, the gospel he actually suffered and died for, was taking the consequences of the people's sins upon himself. In Station 7, Jesus bears the burden of his cross outside the city. Now, the inclusion of Jerusalem here is not a simple artistic adornment, but reflects Passages like Hebrews 11, 10 through 14. There in the Hebrews passage, we learn that the Old Testament sacrifices, like the ones spoken in places like Exodus 29, 14, Leviticus 16, 27, and Numbers 19, 3, all of which took place outside the encampment of Israel, foreshadow Jesus' crucifixion outside the city. The crucifixion happening outside the city also points to the reality that we have no lasting city in this life, but we seek the city that is to come, the heavenly Jerusalem. In the lower left, we see a portion of the story of Abraham and his son Isaac, which is found in Genesis 22. Abraham was told by the Lord to sacrifice his only son Isaac, whom Abraham loved as a burnt offering. The portion of the story depicted is where Isaac is carrying the burden of the wood to be used in his own sacrifice while his father Abraham is carrying the flame or the torch that would be used in the sacrifice. The parallel to our Lord has been seen by many throughout the centuries. Isaac's father Abraham 
is prepared to offer his beloved son as a sacrifice. God the Father offers his beloved son as a sacrifice. Isaac carries the wood of his sacrifice. Jesus carries the wood of his sacrifice. Of course, the difference, as we will see when we get to stage 10, is that Abraham does not have to go through with the sacrifice. A substitute is provided for Isaac. No such reprieve will be offered to Jesus because he is the substitute, the substitute for all of us. In the lower right of Station 7, we see an illustration that reminds us of the time when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. We re read in Exodus, that in the first chapter, that the Egyptians set taskmasters over the Israelites to afflict them with heavy burdens. As they were forced to bear heavy burdens, so Jesus bears our heavy burden. Not only the wood on which he would be crucified, but even more so the heavy burden of our sins. In station eight, Jesus has fallen. Now, you might be surprised to hear this, but you know, scriptures never say that Jesus fell while he was carrying the cross. It's like impossible to imagine he didn't fall down after getting beat like he did. But, you know, uh, the Bible just doesn't say it. Tradition tells us that he fell seven times, and that number was probably uh, thought up to match the seven deadly sins that were so popular in uh, the Middle Ages. The Roman uh, detail that was in charge of Jesus in this station forces a man from the crowd, Simon from the region of Cyrene, to carry the cross of Jesus. Having this happen when Jesus has fallen just makes sense. In the illustration, Simon is depicted as a black man. This is done for several reasons. First, because he was from Cyrene, which is in northern Africa, well, back then it was, uh, chances are pretty good that he was a black person. Second, tradition identifies him as a black man. And third, and this is the most important reason uh, that he is depicted as a black man in our stations here, is that by being a black man, Simon certainly would not have been a physical descendant of Abraham. This reminds us that Jesus is the Savior of all, not just the physical descendants of Abraham. This scene reminds us of several things, other things as well. Simon did not choose to carry the cross of Jesus. He was forced to by the Romans. So with us, we do not choose our crosses. If I could choose my crosses, believe me, they would be light and fluffy. <laughs> you know? uh, another point we are reminded of is that following Jesus always comes at a cost. So Simon, who tradition tells us did indeed become a believer in Christ, began his life of discipleship bearing the cross of Christ, a shameful job in the eyes of the, his contemporaries and one that would have made him unclean in the eyes of the Jews. The very reason he was coming there to participate in the Passover sacrifices and stuff, and now he couldn't participate because he was ceremonially unclean. Now, you might think it is only pious imagination that prompts tradition to indicate that Simon was converted uh, to Christianity. However, did you catch it in our gospel reading out of Mark? We know the names of Simon's boys, Alexander and Rufus. How would we know that if Simon had not become a Christian? In the lower left, we see a scene from the dedication of the temple by Solomon. At the dedication, Solomon and the people pray. And part of that prayer, which is easy to overlook, especially because it's such a long prayer. You think I'm long on Sundays? You should go read this prayer. Solomon was long-winded. <laughs> but he prays this. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this house, 
here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Already, with the construction of the first temple, the assumption is that the worship life of Israel is for all people, not just Jews. The temple and sacrificial system are then also for all people and not just Jews. And the Savior to which the entire worship life of Israel pointed was not just for the physical descendants of Abraham, but for all people, Jews and Gentiles, Israelites and foreigners. In the lower right, we see a story from the ministry of Elisha. Naaman was a commander in the army of Syria, a state which was generally an enemy of Israel. He was afflicted with leprosy. Having heard about Elijah, he visits the prophet. Elijah tells him to dip himself seven times in the Jordan to be clean. Naaman does, and he is cured. That is more than enough to convince the military commander that the God of Israel was the real deal, and he comes to faith in the one true God. Once again, we see that the God of the Old Testament is not just the God of the Jews, but the God of all humanity. And that includes people that we might consider our natural enemies. As Simon was a foreigner, so Solomon prays for foreigners. As Naaman was a foreigner, so Jesus dies for all, even foreigners. As the hero in an action film battles for the sake of others, suffering all sorts of abuse to accomplish the deliverance of those he loves, so Jesus suffers all sorts of abuse for those he loves. However, those he loves are far greater in number than simply a wife or child or a dear friend. Those he loves is all humanity, including you and me. Again, at each station, we have the triangle that reminds us that the triune God is not absent. Nothing that is transpiring is out of control. At each station, we also continue to find the small cross filling up bit by bit with more darkness as Jesus grows more and more isolated, as the weight of our sins bear down on him. And at each station, we find a serpent striking at the heel of Jesus, reflecting Genesis 3, 15. Step by step, our Lord draws closer to death. Step by step, he draws closer to Golgotha. Step by step, he draws closer to his grave. And step by step, we travel with him to witness the greatest heroic act of all time, when the Son of Man himself bore our judgment as he was cut off out of the land of the living, that all people may live forever. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.